Brothers and friends, good evening. It's good to see you all here on the Rubicon Masonic Society Video Education Conference once again. Uh, it is the month of February, and we have a very special evening and presenter for you tonight. We hope you enjoy and are ready to learn attentively and become better Masons, hopefully, as a result. On behalf of the Rubicon Masonic Society, again, I want to thank you and and hope you are enjoying these, these episodes. This is our 56th episode of our virtual Masonic education discussions since we started this in 2020. The series is entitled 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we thank you. And for those of you who are coming back, we appreciate your continued support of our Masonic journey together. And finally, for anyone that may be watching a recording of this video online, we appreciate your support as well, and you may continue to be notified by subscribing to our YouTube channel or RSVPing to attend live at RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash RSVP. Of course, we need to give a special thanks to those lodges and brothers that continue to help push this boulder up the mountain, so to speak. Lexington Lodge number one, William O'Ware, Lodge of Research, and of course, all the brothers at the Rubicon Masonic Society, specifically Worship Brother John Bizak, Worship Brother Dan Kimball, and Worship Brother Alan Martin. My name is Brian Evans, and we will now proceed with the business of the evening. Worship Brother Alan, would you please do the honors of delivering our open devotion, sir? Uh, brothers, let's pray. Grand Architect of the Universe, Creator of all things, we ask for your blessing this evening as we gather once more to explore Freemasonry and do us with the competency of your divine wisdom that we may be better enabled to focus our thoughts and actions as we endeavor to be just and upright men and Masons. As we gather together, we praise you for this day and your purpose for it. Amen. So mode it be. So mode it be. Thank you, Brother Chaplain. Brothers, if you'll indulge me for a few more minutes, we'll finish some housekeeping and we'll jump right into the education. As you know, our virtual Masonic education, it aims to help us to become better men, always devoted to our family, our faith, and our country. So may we always come together to learn, to subdue our passions, to discipline our minds, and to improve ourselves through the tools of each other and Freemasonry. Any opinions expressed, expressed during this virtual education will be those of the presenter, they do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. Our full disclaimer can be found at rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash disclaimer. As you know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are welcome to attend and, and participate. So please be mindful, brothers, that anything discussed should be suitable for Masons of all degrees as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected. Please no alcohol, no smoking, no eating, no foul language, no discussion of politics or religion, uh, except for any discussions that might occur with presentations, of course, within reason, and attendees may be removed if not following protocol. Please remember that recommended attire for each meeting is coat and tie. Please type your name in your appropriate Masonic title next to your video. If you're not a Mason, please type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera if you want us to see you, which we like to see most of you, except for David Crickert. Uh, please reduce background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking. Please turn off all other computer programs. Try to eliminate outside distractions. And remember, David, I am just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> Worship Brother Bizak, would you please do the honors of presenting tonight's excellent guest? Thank you, brother. Worshipful brother David Daughtery is a third generation Mason. He's current master of the Ohio Lodge of Research and past master of Washington Lodge 17 in Hamilton, Ohio. He holds a PhD in chemistry. He instructs at the Miami University in Oxford. Uh, that's in Ohio. Dr. Daughtery has served as Grand Lodge of Ohio as district education officer and deputy district grand master. And he's a member of several research organizations and holds the title of Master of the Craft in Ohio's Royal Schofield Society. Brother David, I'm glad to have you with us tonight. And the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. If I can uh, share my, figure out how to share my screen here, um, we'll get started here. Uh, let's see. 
All right, you should be seeing mostly a blank screen at this point. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Do a little housekeeping on my computer and then we'll get started. All right, well, thank you very much. It is absolutely an honor to present for the Rubicon Society. I've been attending the virtual programs for quite a while. I've joined you for uh, several of the festive awards. So uh, Brother Evans, thank you. Also, thank you to the rest of the members for always welcoming me when I, when I show up virtually or in person. A uh, special thank you to Brother Bizak and Brother Kimball for coordinating this invitation tonight, making it possible for me to, to share my ideas. Uh, I've enjoyed and appreciated every time our paths have crossed, and I, I look forward to many of that happening many more times. Um, uh, it's already been said, but it's, of course, necessary to begin with, uh, with a, a uh, you go. necessary to begin with a little disclaimer. Um, I want to emphasize that the thoughts and opinions expressed in this presentation are mine and mine alone. They are not, they do not represent the thoughts or ideas of any other organization, Lodge or Grand Lodge. They are my thoughts as I understand them today. However, I will continue to learn and explore. Therefore, I reserve the right to change my opinion as needed and based on any new information. The title of this presentation pays homage to the 1959 essay written by Nobel physicist Richard Feynman. If you've read this, what we're going to see tonight is quite a different talk. Nonetheless, he, he is not a Mason, but he is, he and his work have always been an inspiration to me because he, if nothing else, encouraged people to think differently, both in science, but also in life in general. For those of you wondering what you've gotten yourself into, this is a presentation about comparing Masonic lodges to naturally occurring systems, to systems that will never optimize, but are constantly improving and creating novelty and flexibility, which allows for anticipation of the unforeseen needs of the future. So where do we start with this? My Masonic journey, like most of my life, has centered on education. Other than trying to better understand the world around me, I'm still not sure I completely understand what education really even is. I, in fact, I've, I've participated in many conversations. I've asked many brothers to try to answer the question, what is Masonic education? And I wanna be very clear, we are not going to answer this question tonight, but it is important to acknowledge that we are always on a journey to collect knowledge, educate ourselves, an attempt to understand the world better today than we did yesterday. In my Masonic research efforts, I've tried to explore many topics, and because my interest and curiosities are more broad than my common sense, I often get myself in a little over my head. Frequently, I have to remind myself, and other people have to remind me, to simply write what you know. I am trained in organic chemistry and biochemistry. I've worked in academics and industry focusing on biotechnology. But I firmly believe anything we can think of, not only has nature already done it, but nature can do it better than we can ever hope to achieve. And that quite simply is the foundation on which I have created this presentation tonight. My first, and I will definitely say unfinished draft of the original paper attempted to shift the way we think about a Lodge of Masons and consider the behaviors of a Lodge as if it is a living organism rather than an inanimate object that exists in most of our minds. At the point in which I was convinced to abandon that first draft, it was over 20 pages long and quite frankly left no hope for the poor reader. I had tried to make every possible connection between chemistry biology and Freemasonry I could conceive in one story, and admittedly, it became rather incomprehensible. With some sound counsel whispered in my ear, I decided to focus on one idea, complexity. Anyone who has studied chemistry, biology, science in general, understands why we are interested in and why we are concerned about the complexity of science. We live in a complex world, and science is simply an effort to simplify that complexity into understandable and digestible portions. Or said another way, even when we consider topics such as Freemasonry, 
complexity really is the underlying challenge of most questions we attempt to answer. There is too much information to process, and quite frankly, we get overwhelmed very easily. For example, leadership is complicated under the best of circumstances. The head of any group has to consider personnel, organization, and management. He has to make sure that the bills get paid. Communication is critical to leadership, both effective, both effective internally and externally. A good leader knows that he has to keep his, his workers motivated. And ironically, I'm not even going to attempt to describe the necessity of time management in the few minutes that I have tonight. Among many other challenges, the challenges that are often intangible are the ones that are the most difficult to confront. Then if we add to this the concept of masonry, it gets even more complicated. One of the greatest challenges I've ever faced was making my way to the east of a Masonic Lodge. In addition to all of those normal challenges of being the leader of any other group, the worshipful master needs to ensure his officers are properly trained. He, of course, bears the responsibility of ensuring quality ritual performance by the lodge. There are numerous ceremonies that must be performed. And of course, all that comes with a great deal of memorization. And a good Mason should always be reading and continuing his education. Unfortunately, every Mason also needs to be prepared to address those numerous misconceptions about the fraternity. And what is a Mason if he does not properly care for his family before all else? And of course, time management is such a challenge, it needs to be mentioned again. Of course, there are many Masonic intangibles you can't even consider until you are sitting in that chair. In short, leadership of a Masonic Lodge is a complex thing. But at its core, the Masonic Lodge is simply a group of individuals trying to achieve a common goal while simultaneously working towards their own individual goals. Every group of people struggles with social interactions and personal goals that get in the way of the goals of the group. In some ways, however, Masonic Lodges may be more likely to succumb to the negative social interactions, despite the idealized principles on which we believe the fraternity is based. Of course, you should be asking why. Well, number one, a secret initiation means many members join without even understanding what they're really getting into. Officers oftentimes progress through the chairs as a result of attendance rather than ability. Leaders, once they get into that chair, often have one year to accomplish everything they've ever hoped to accomplish. And because of that frequent leadership change, focus of the lodge changes every year. Previous leaders may even become unwanted advisory board if they keep repeating the phrase, well, that's not how we did it in my year. Hopefully these issues do not describe your lodge, but we all know of lodges facing these challenges or similar ones. Interestingly, though, all of these issues are manageable if only lodges will start operating a little differently. One of the reasons we're challenged by the complexity of leadership and management is we typically plan for the worst. We assume something is going to go wrong. Therefore, we spend most, most of our time fighting fires. Or said another way, we assume failure while claiming to prepare for success. My humble opinion, this approach to leadership and management is very unmasonic, by which that by which I mean it is based on a system of distrust. Recall what I said earlier. I have this belief that that anything we can think of, nature has already done it and done it better, better than we can ever hope to achieve. From that perspective, nature is very masonic. Natural systems assume success while preparing for failure. Or said another way, it is based on a system of trust. And I don't think it's too difficult to say that nature is far more complex than a Masonic Lodge. If we look at a few examples of how nature deals with complexity and cooperation, consider the, in any ecosystem, thousands or millions of organisms existing together with their lives intertwined. Some are working together to survive, others exist at the expense of the species around them. But in either case, they are dependent on one another. And although this little image that I have may seem very complex, 
Even the ecosystem in the average backyard consists of over a thousand coordinated species relying on one another for survival. Consider a flock of birds, anywhere from 500 to 25,000 coordinated individuals working together for many reasons. Most commonly, the protection and survival of the group is the one, one of the many advantages that we consider from this flocking behavior. Of course, not all systems consist of sentient or animated individuals. Riverbanks account for millions of particles per cubic foot, and the process of erosion accounts for adaptations spanning generations and impacting the earth forever. Our circulatory system consists of anywhere from 20 to 30 trillion blood cells, of course, delivering the essentials that our body needs at the very moment they are needed with no immediate control other than the simple laws of physics. So what do all these examples have in common? They are all complex adaptive systems. A complex adaptive system are groups of individuals working separately but together such that the individuals learn from one another in a process that improves the whole. Well, over the next few minutes, we'll look at a few examples and some illustrations of complex adaptive systems, but the qualities of these systems can be summarized as follows. Supervision is not necessary. Organization derives from a few simple self-governing rules. Successful strategies originate from the individuals. However, those individuals are often unaware of their impact on the greater good. No individual is capable of overwhelming the system because a positive effect will not immediately benefit the whole. The advantage of that is also that neither will a negative effect ever be catastrophic to the system. And flexibility from numerous individuals inhibits, or excuse me, individual inputs allows the system to quickly adapt to changes in the environment. How this differs from other systems is that individuals have an opportunity to respond to the immediate conditions in which they exist. And therefore they follow their own course of actions as long as it does not interfere with the actions of any of the individuals of, of the other individuals. Therefore, individuals constantly revise and rearrange in order to gradually improve the system. The revision and arrangement of a system can be as simple as geese choosing the best flight path. As each bird flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird that follows which allows for a 70% increase in the flight range of the group compared to the flight of an individual bird. And if a goose falls out of formation, it, feel, it immediately feels the drag of flying alone and adjusts it path, its path in order to aid itself as well as the group. On the other hand, the revision or rearrangement can be more involved, like army ants building bridges to span distances 10 to 20 times their own body length. The ants can use this to coordinate dynamic constructions to acquire otherwise impossible food sources. Or they have even been known to use their own bodies to create a highway over rough terrain in order to accommodate more efficient travel for an invading army. As a result of this constant revision and adjustment, every individual in a complex adaptive system has the opportunity to learn from its own successes and failures as well as those of its counterparts. As a result, the system continuously improves. Likewise, each individual in a complex adaptive system has the opportunity to make decisions for themselves while still operating within the confines of a larger system. Rather than being micromanaged and controlled during every minute detail of the process, individuals are given a few simple rules to follow that maintain the fundamental order of the system. The group behavior is derived from those simple rules. How simple, you ask? Consider these flocking birds. They abide by three rules, very simply. Align flight with your neighbor, avoid hitting your neighbor, and remain an average distance from your neighbor. Within a flock of birds, all other decisions are left to the individual 
as long as these three rules are followed and the elaborate complexity that we observe in flocks of birds is the result of those three rules. Going back to the army ants, consider the bridges that they built. They simply follow two rules. If there's an ant on your back, freeze. If there's been no ant on your back for a certain amount of time, go. All other decisions are left to the individual, where to go, how fast to go, when to go, as long as he abides by these two rules and the elaborate constructions of these bridges are what we observe. Consider human behavior. We, of course, would like to think we are much more advanced than birds and ants. But watch a stadium of, th of tens of thousands of fans mindlessly form the wave. Only one rule is necessary. Do what the person to your left does. As long as you do that, we will create the wave. Individuals react to the conditions in which they exist. Therefore, the different individuals will pursue different courses and lead to varying degrees of success. Remember, nature assumes success while allowing for some failure. Because each individual is free to follow their own course, success is not guaranteed for any individual, but no attempts are discouraged because it's not possible to predict what success will look like. For example, if you were designing an animal that has to survive in the wild, I'm pretty sure that not a single one of you would have drawn up the platypus or the sloth or the oxalotl or the immortal jellyfish. None of these we probably would have predicted to be as successful as they are. Nonetheless, the successful actions of individuals become the typical behavior of the group. Some will fail, no matter how well planned. And the vision of success is impossible to predict. And if you don't believe me, take, for example, this one last example of the blobfish. One strength of such a system is that no one individual is completely responsible for the overall success of the system. Then no one individual can, either, can also have an overwhelming impact on the whole system. The complex adaptive systems of nature resemble what is known in the organizational world as bottom-up structures. By contrast, the business world, which masonry often attempts to mimic, typically relies on a top-down structure. So there are some organizations that absolutely thrive with a top-down structure. A couple of examples that I found from this rigid top-down structure are things like the military in which command needs to be followed or in, in, in a very different example, but in an executive kitchen. These are situations in which time is of the essence and delayed decisions can lead to catastrophic failure. One advantage of top-down organization is that they lead to fast-paced decision-making. However, making a fast decision is often more about finding an answer right now than it is about finding the right answer. On the other hand, what I've been attempting to show in, in some examples tonight, we would describe through the natural bottom-up relationships between autonomous individuals working together. More accurately described, as a system of connections. Remember, all complex adaptive systems are groups of individuals working separately, but together, such that the individuals learn from one another in a process that improves the whole. And the autonomy of the individuals result from systems in which supervision was not necessary. Organization was derived from a few very simple, easy follow easy to follow rules. Successful strategies originated from the individuals. No individual was capable of overwhelming the system because all results, positive or negative, had to be duplicated by other individuals in order for that to spread through the system. And options followed by numerous diverse individuals created a flexibility which allowed the system to quickly adapt to changes in the environment. Like nature, masonry is connections. Every mason makes connections, and every lodge makes connections. The connections are more important than the lodge or the individual. 
because we learn from one another and adapt by mimicking the behaviors of other Masons that lead to success for us and for the fraternity. Following the connections and allowing every Mason to pursue their own approach leads to new, unexpected ideas that may be more valuable to the fraternity than anything attempted before. Encouraging one another and pursuing a wide range of approaches is about the right idea emerging at the right time as a result of many individuals connecting for the greater good. Back when I mentioned that paper that was well over 20 pages and not reaching an end, I'd begun this journey by asking, are lodges alive? But I realized through this process that the reality is we should be accepting that lodges live organically. A Masonic Lodge is a collective of equals, consisting of many excited brothers who want to be involved. They do not want instructions to mindlessly follow. They want to contribute. Like the flexibility observed in the complex adaptive systems, the diversity and creativity of ideas will lead to unpredictable successes for the fraternity. Like the successful strategies of complex adaptive systems, Good ideas will grow naturally from the excitement of those brothers. Rather than attempting to control every step of every task of a lodge, a master will be better rewarded to relinquish the detailed control of decision making to those brothers who have been trained in the teachings and philosophies of Freemasonry. Like the simple rules given to the individuals of complex adaptive systems, each Freemason is given the simple tenets of the fraternity to guide them. A master will be better rewarded to realize his best course of action is to provide good counsel and guidance and trust that the brothers will make good decisions for the lodge. Masonry is an organization of equals, so there is plenty of room at the bottom for good decisions to be made. But a bottom-up management will require some cultural changes in many of our lodges. The connections of the brothers should be allowed to thrive so new, unplanned, unexpected ideas can emerge. Masters will have to accept they do not possess all of the answers. Everyone will have to accept successes of the past may not equal success in the future. Therefore, all members should be encouraged to explore new approaches, and all masters should empower the creativity of the brethren of their lodge. In other words, we need to capitalize on the diverse characteristics and skills of the brothers that may have been previously buried and lost in our lodges. However, even if our lodges do begin to mimic that which I've, that we've observed in the natural world, and they start operating truly as bottom-up organizations, I do offer at least one word of caution. Unlike many of the individual agents that I've described in these examples of complex adaptive systems tonight, man also has the ability to discuss, measure, and analyze the world around him. While this can be an advantage as we are trying to solve problems and create the future, that is a unique strength but we also have to realize that we have a tendency to overanalyze. One advantage of a complex adaptive system is the potential for those unexpected solutions to emerge from the actions of individuals and produce results better than anyone may have ever anticipated. Solutions from a wide range of diverse, creative, and non-traditional methods may look unconventional at first glance. We need to be careful not to overlook those ideas and those opportunities that arrive from atypical sources due to the misuse of our ability to analyze, educate, and communicate. We need to avoid overanalysis and keep open minds because preconceived notions can lead to missed opportunities. Putting this as a conclusion in much simpler terms, Freemasonry produced by bottom up connections may not be the Freemasonry of our fathers, but it can be the Freemasonry of the future. It will be adaptable, flexible Freemasonry, capable of guiding and preparing good men to lead the next generation. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. 
Thank you, Worship Brother David. What an interesting, enjoyable lesson that was. Um, forgot how much fun science and biology actually can be. <laughs> uh, I wish my old teachers used to teach it that way with a little bit more enjoyment. <laughs> uh, maybe I would have gotten a better grade. <clears throat> so this, you know, this is interesting. Um, brother, let me actually, let me share my screen again. Excuse me for one moment yep. while I get that set back up. Okay, so brothers, if you have a question or a comment, uh, please raise your virtual hand or enter it in the chat box. I'll try to get to it. Just some housekeeping for that. If you have a comment, please try to keep your comment uh, brief. Uh, questions are certainly preferred more than anything to engage the speaker. So if you do have a comment as well, uh, just please try to keep that brief um, so we can continue to proceed accordingly. Bless you. Worship Brother David. Um, I have a couple questions. So I guess a lot of what me personally, I I, I think I gr agreed with and grasped what you were saying, but there were a few that not, not as much. So you said that masonry okay. were all equals. We're, we're an institution of equal, equals, I believe is what you said. Is that accurate? Okay. That sounds right. Yep. So are we really equals and, and how are you defining equals and I and I asked that question just to get your your scientific perspective on that analogy because I f it seems as though there are some masons that certainly put in a lot more time and effort and energy and commitment than other masons. So I, I guess I'm I, just I your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I think I mean there's a couple of ways to answer that, and and we are we should be all equals. I think to your point, we we are not all equals because we all don't behave the same. And probably a better way to say that is that we should strive to be equal, but what we really have is equitability. In other words, we should all have the same opportunities. We do not have, all, we all don't have the same skills. We all can't achieve the same goals, but we should be given the opportunity to achieve those. And I think that's largely what, what I'm trying to get at here is that you know, we all know some lodges where it's truly a top down, where the master sits upon high and tells everybody what to do. And there are many of the Masons in that lodge that have a lot of really good ideas, but they, we never get to hear them. And so it's the idea of the, of being equitable so that more ideas are expressed. Okay. I got you. Makes, make, that makes sense. So from your scientific perspective, going back to the, the uh, origination of Masonry, however you want to define that time period. How did nature, how, what was nature's role or how did nature impact the creation of masonry in, in, your, um, in, in your scientific perspective? Well, I, again, that's, that's, that, we could spend the next few hours just talking about that. Uh, the, uh, um, I think at least from my perspective, the view that we had, meaning man had, of nature and of the world around us a few hundred years ago was quite different. Just in the simple idea that we lived in it and it was part of us and our world, as opposed to today, I think most people operate from a sense of manipulating the world around us. We, we rather than adjusting to it, we expect it to, to adjust to us. And so I think if nothing else, that's kind of the basis upon which masonry Freemasonry was was likely originated was there was already this um, symbiotic relationship, if you will. Now, if you then, I mean, the other way you could approach that is, you know, there is definitely an alchemical uh, connection to Freemasonry and the origins and the philosophy and so forth. And um, again, I could I, I risk going too far down a rabbit hole here, but. Um, what alchemy really was, not wasn't about turning lead into gold, what alchemy really was, was a way of understanding how we, how man fit into nature and how man fit into world, both mentally and physically and, uh, and spiritually. So I think that absolutely was wrapped into what the, the, what I view as those origins of Freemasonry. Okay. My perspective, and this is my last question, brothers, for now. <laughs> we'll open, but, so my my perspective comes more from uh, economics. So my background is economics. So when I think of 
of this, I think of supply and demand and always going towards equilibrium on some level. So is the few, how do you think nature is going to affect the future of masonry? And are we, are we transferring to a, a sure. state of equilibrium at this point? Um, so I mentioned that, uh, when I first sat down to write this, I, it, it just overwhelmed me. I had too many ideas and, and I have this, this was the first kind of thing that I brought to, to fruition along this idea. I have this vision that there will be several other parts that will hit some of the other ideas. Equilibrium is one of those ideas that I, I want to come back and, and talk about partly because of just some of the different definitions and descriptions of what equilibrium is. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, I think it definitely wraps together, fits together, at least with my uh, take or my interpretation of what equilibrium is from a biological biochemical standpoint, which is, is, is what do we need in order to maintain stability? In mm -hmm. other words, we, we can't let it stagnate. We have to keep putting energy in. We have to keep feeding it in order to keep it alive. And that's, I think, largely how I think of the equilibrium and think of that aspect to, to Freemasonry as well is we have, you know, there are too many of us, too many of our brothers who, who join and then stagnate. And we need to figure out how to help them keep it alive as well. Good. Appreciate your input on that. Sorry to... Yeah. take the floor all of a sudden uh brother Chet, right. you have a question go ahead uh sure uh brother Dowdy, uh chad kapansky uh nobody of any real um importance but one of the questions i have um i really liked your your explanation but where i was trying to kind of make sense out of this is in nature who sets the vision for lack of a better word right so we I mean, is it just this imperative to keep going? Is it the, but if we're going to use this analogy of like a natural system for a lodge, doesn't something have to kind of set the vision or the, 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 where the organism is going or what the organism's ultimate goals are? I was trying to figure out how that fits into the model you're talking about. Well, I think, um, so vision, vision is a, a challenge, of course, for, um, for any organization, for any lodge. And from a very simplistic viewpoint, the way that I see the vision being set in these natural systems is quite simply survival. Now, obviously we want to do more than just survive, but that's what it comes down to is the, which, whichever organism, whichever group gains the biggest advantage survives the most they win so to speak but the one thing that we often forget about that and i think this is how we we tie it into to masonry is that as i mentioned a minute ago the world is not stagnant right what you have what the the skills you need to survive today in nature are quite different than the skills you might need to survive a year from now or 10 years from now or whenever you know, think about it, you know, you know, from a very simplistic viewpoint, uh, you know, being here in Ohio yesterday, it was 20 degrees outside and today it's 60, right? If you're, uh, if you're an animal living outside, you better be able to adjust to those temperatures very, very quickly. If you don't have that ability, you will not survive. So what, what skills are necessary is constantly changing. And so that's where this idea of having many ideas pursued at the same time creates a flexibility when one group, one part of the group or one person may not be able to, 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 um, to survive in the sense that they, they have reached an optimum, another set of part of the group will step up and take over. And I think that's where we have to relate that or where I would like to relate that to this idea of the lodge and Freemasonry is that there, there is no one, I've never met one person who can do everything that is needed to run a lodge. There is nobody who is good at ritual, who is good at bookkeeping, who is who is good at paying the bills, who is good at the administrative, who's good at membership, who's good at everything. We need to take advantage of the many different skills that are out there so that when one aspect becomes at least momentarily more important than another, we already have a group 
or a set of people who are skilled to achieve that goal. So the vision kind of sets itself by the needs. Now, I think the, you know, where this kind of, I shouldn't say falls apart, but where we have to go beyond the analogy is, as I said earlier, in Freemasonry, we want to do more than survive. We want to, we want to push forward. And so that's where the vision of the lodge, the vision of the of Freemasonry needs to be expanded beyond just that idea of survival. Interesting. Chad, does that answer your question? Do you any follow up? I tend to not argue with uh, Brother uh, Doherty when he's right. So I, I've gotten out of that habit. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, Brother Daniel. Uh, yes. Uh, when I hear Brother Doherty talking about the inherent flexibility of nature as an essential element to survive, you know, the the flock of birds tends to have a an awareness that surrendering the focus on the self to the betterment of the group has a wonderful effect of supporting the self in the long run. But there's not much of a, a self-centered ego nature about that. Where humans, on the other hand, with our great cognitive capabilities, are can twist things around into becoming focused on serving the self. So how do you deal with the human tendency to put the self first, which inadvertently puts the group last, and the ability to overcome that, to be able to recognize that serving the common good will in the long run be in the best interest of the self? That is a great question. Um, you know, I think, you know, like, and I kind of even made a reference to that in my caution is that, you know, unfortunately, one of our biggest issues is unfortunately we are human and therefore we behave like humans. You know, if, uh, you know, with the biggest problem with any organization, Freemasonry included, is sometimes the people involved. And all we can do is encourage the, group as a whole to behave to operate in the, the what is best for the group and those who don't fall in line those who are more focused on the individual i think over time will it's not the right phrase but they'll almost be weeded out right their influence will will diminish um but like you said there will always be people who are more interested in the self than they are in the group but as you pointed out in your question, oftentimes what is good for the group is very good for the self. Mm -hmm. Make sense? It does. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there is a balancing point. If I take care of me by serving the group, the group takes care of me. If I'm giving to the group to the point that I'm exhausting my resources, there is a detriment to that. And if I draw from the group without giving anything back, there's a detriment to that. And so that kind of brings in that concept of equilibrium, giving and benefiting in a balance at various times so that all are served well. Yeah. And I think you know, kind of related to that, we've, we've all seen uh, brothers who have assumed the East taken over a lodge and they give it everything they've got. And by the end of the, the, their term, they're so exhausted, we never see them again. They've burnt themselves out. And that's a really good example of what happens when somebody gives too much. They don't rely on the group. And that's part of what I was trying to get at is, is that you know, the, the, the leader of any group, but the master of a lodge does not have to have all of the answers. They do not have to solve all of the problems. They just have to put the right people in place who can solve the problems and who do have all the answers and it makes it a whole it would make it a whole lot easier and a lot less exhausting for all of us if we did it that way good point very good point uh, brother mario go ahead 
Good evening, brothers. And uh, Brother David, it, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it because it, it's really hard um, for me to find people who actually like to bring this scientific aspect of life, which is undeniable, uh, into Freemasonry. Actually, I'm working in a paper um, or, yeah, on a paper which is to, based on the scientific principles applied in Freemasonry. And um, I was I was sort of expecting a different talk. I couldn't really figure what what you were going to present, but um, but I mean I, I really enjoyed the way you presented your idea and the way the complexity becomes just a, a nice image of how nature presents uh, the way it does its process, and it's just a, a I think it's a great guide for us to try to work in unison in the same way that nature develops its its own mechanisms to you know to survive to evolve to become better um i i seriously have a little dilemmas and i've sort of um talked about them here with, with the brothers in this uh, discussions uh one of the things i i always try to balance is the the way we see for example uh, mysticism and philosophy and we try to bring that together to this new um, world that is in front of us every time like we're getting different type of of knowledge and it's every it's ever more precise or more non-intuitive and it's like um it becomes very complex um, and absolutely i you can see that for example something that it's taught and in you know like it is encouraged by all by by our fraternity is that we deepen into the seven liver arts and, arts, arts and sciences and in this sense, um, like for example, geometry and astronomy are are very important for us. Just in the way we should look at that to appreciate what the universe is and how it behaves and so and how it shows its patterns to us. Um, so my my question is more like, what is your your thought? What what are your thoughts on how to merge this past teachings that we have and this new um wave or trend of knowledge that it's that as i said is ever more um precise and and beautiful at the same time and and how can we make something of freemasonry and and simplify that complexity for all brothers to participate because it's always great to have this talk i mean not everybody but at least the people that are interested so what would be your thoughts on on how to put these two things together that our fraternity is really strong in. I mean, we, we have all this philosophic and moral aspects of, a, of behavior as a collective. And at the same time, we have, for example, for me, the great unifier of man is that even though you may have a different religion and, and I might understand the origin of the universe uh, since from this religion, my, from my religion that is different from yours, in the end, we all live under nat natural and physical rules. So it's 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 very challenging for me to ask people to look into nature and at the same time, um, you know, not get too far away from from our our systems of morality and and philosophy. So could you give me a a, a thought about that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that you know you're 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 inter you're kind of verging on an interesting idea, and and at some level, this conversation, if I'm understanding it correctly, has has been going on for for a long time, and you know, and it's really I don't want to go too far down that road, but it's you know, it's almost the the science religion conversation, and you know, do we you know how do we deal with both of them? And I can only answer, obviously, from my own perspective, which is I don't see a difference between them. I see the philosophy or religion or, or whatever term you want to use that as simply one way of describing the world and science as another way of describing the same world. It doesn't mean one is right and the other is wrong. They're just two different perspectives. It's kind of like the old story of the the three blind men with the elephant, right? You know, they each they each were were grabbing a hold of a different part of the elephant and describing it, and but they were you know they thought they were looking at something completely different, and so you know this the connection I make here is that 
the you know if we go back through time you know the question was asked earlier about you know how does this fit with the origins of freemasonry what we're really going doing is looking at a time that was for all practical purposes pre-science right the the royal society in the 1600s were was kind of where the scientific method began and we started approaching it and by the way many of those were masons and uh, um so you know they were very much involved in that process and as the knowledge of science continued to increase it wasn't that the need or or knowledge of religion decreased it wasn't like a give and take it's not a zero sum game it's just that different descriptions were available for the same things and in some cases one may fit, suit your needs better than the other now when they contradict is when we have to be cautious and 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 worry and and see and kind of come up with a different approach there um, but more often than not i don't think there there needs to be a contradiction it, it, instead it's like i said different perspectives different sides of the same coin I'm not sure if i completely answered what you were getting at but those were the, the thoughts off the top of my head anyway Yes, I mean, um, I understand completely what you're saying. Actually, I, I, I don't even think they're the different interpretations of the of the of the of the same thing. I think that they're complementary to each other because there's some things you don't ever know, and you actually get into most of the time you will try to get into deeper knowledge by using philosophy. You know, so it's it's very interesting in the way that that you know, like how if you're thinking quantum mechanics they all feel like it starts becoming a little dogmatic because you have to believe in the uncertainty principle. And this is just like, there is something going on that you don't know, you don't understand, can't predict, can't really uh, tell how it's going to go, but you have to believe that it is true. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it presents itself as a dogma. So in the end, it's, it's, it's kind of philosophical in the same way, but I do agree. I mean, I just, I just wanted the, to, to hear you talk about it since you are, <laughs> you are involved in this world of, of, you know, like, because patterns and, and complex mechanisms in nature are just beautiful to watch. And, and I think that should be a little bit more in, in uh, have a little more presence in our fraternity, just in the sake of appreciating what, what it has been created for us to enjoy and, you know, like sort of uh, become in awe of what we have in front of us. But I thank you. I thank you so much. And I, I, I'm sorry, I apologize because I didn't turn on my video, but I'm not in the correct attire. But I didn't want to, I don't want to miss the presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your points of view with us, brother. Thank David. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brother Mario. Good to hear from you. Brother Bruce, go ahead. Thank you, Worshipful Brother Brian. And also, thank you, Worshipful Brother David. Uh, as you were talking, I was reminded of something, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but here recently I discovered the old Kung Fu video or show, and uh, I was watching one recently, and the blind master was sharing with Kwai Chang, uh, and he started off by saying simply, he was talking about that we can learn something from the children, in their simple games and it was rock, paper, scissors. And he then related that to the lessons and the elder said that there are three treasures that he had held uh, and he passed those on. And I don't remember the exact, I wish I'd have already transcribed this so I could read it to you. But it was basically, he said, you know, this leads to this and this leads to this. And I think the last one was about humility and that it leads to being willing to serve. And I was like, that to me is what we're talking about, learning to humble ourselves and not get such big heads so that we can serve and truly be of service. And uh, being retired, <laughs> now in my life i am learning that my biggest i guess gift is that i'm trying to network what i know to those who are around me and help serve them by sharing that knowledge and the one thing that i would uh, i don't know if you had the pleasure uh, but i would 
hope that everybody could watch this. I think it was on National Geographic, but Bob Woodruff, who's the national uh, news reporter that was injured in the war, uh, it's called Operation Arctic Cure. And to talk about seeing a group that were totally unknown to one another because they were all veterans, but didn't really know one another. And they came together and learned to serve one another in their various skills and ways is exactly what we're talking about. You know, because the one gal who was uh, uh, had lost a leg, I guess one day she didn't prepare properly and the metal started hurting her to the point from her prosthetic and the connection it made with the bone that she couldn't walk any further. And the team first nurtured her and met her need. And then they worked together and helped continue on the course so that she could still be part of the group and didn't have to turn, you know, the, them as a group, they didn't have to turn back. They continued on their journey. So, you know, I, I think that's a lot of it is we just need to learn to humble ourselves an awful lot and not have such big heads. Uh, I am like Brother Mario. I am sorry that I am not showing myself, but I too am inappropriately dressed. So I apologize for that, but I did want to hear this. And um, I'm right down the road from you in Cincinnati, Brother David. And I look forward to uh, meeting you sometime in the near future. And uh, if you can share your PowerPoint, I would love to have a copy of it because I'm the lodge education officer for my lodge. And I think there are some points I'd really like to share with my brother Masons in my lodge. So very good. And uh, thank you all. Very good. Thank you, Brother Bruce. Um, this is being recorded, so that presentation will be on YouTube as well, just just so you have it. <clears throat> um, Worship Brother Bizak, I believe you mentioned you had a comment or question. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, David, what an interesting and refreshing presentation and approach to exploring masonry and its many facets. Seems like um, just the comment I have is the message. Um, Maybe the lesson from nature is that it's the absence of ego in nature that makes it thrive. And the comparison of the lesson that uh, perhaps Masonry could use that same principle. Hmm. Thank you for taking your time and putting this together. I know you whittled it down a lot from 20 pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think, you know, I, I haven't phrased it that way, but the absence of ego is 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 a big part of it. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I have a, a few of my friends and I, we, we often joke that, you know, when we show up to a meeting or we uh, you know, go to a conference or something, what we, we, we assume that we try to assume that we are the dumbest person in the room. And uh, because it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what your education is, doesn't matter what you know, there's always somebody in that room from whom you can learn. There's always something you don't know. And, and I think that's really kind of what I'm, you know, part of what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, when you look at, when you go to a lodge, when you look at all the brothers sitting on the sidelines in the columns, there, there are a lot of people there who have good ideas and we need to start for lack of a better word, mining them in order to, to bring those ideas out. Because I think in many lodges for too many years, they've effectively been told to, to sit on the sidelines and be quiet when we've missed some really good opportunities. So, you know, not only get rid of the ego, but try to, uh, to build up and support many of those other people who, whom we can learn from. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, well said. Um, Brother David, you made a comment, and I think it was related to a particular slide. Um, you said leadership is based on a system of distrust. Yes, that was when I was talking about the the top down specifically yeah. in kind of a traditional sense. Yes. Could you just maybe 
go into that a little bit further about w what exactly you meant again? And well, yeah, I, I can try. Um, I mean, I think, like I said, it goes back to the comment that I, I made along that same time, which is that uh, you know we we say that we are preparing for future, or excuse me, I misspoke. We say that we are preparing for success, but oftentimes what we are actually doing is assuming that we're going to fail. So you know, there's there's a big difference between assuming failure and assuming success. And and so when we assume failure, when we are the when we are the one sitting in those leader leadership positions and we ask somebody to do a job for us, if we don't trust them to do it to their to the best of their ability, then we're really not trusting them. We, you know, we need to be able to, like I said, put good people in place, give them a task, and then get out of their way and let them do that task. Trust that they're going to do it, not only to the best of their ability, but probably because presumably you have given, you've put an expert in that position, they're going to do it better than you could probably have come up with on your own. So when we micromanage, when we try to control exactly how every task is completed among those who are working for and, and under us, we distrust them. And, and I think this idea of the bottom up is the idea of give them as few guidelines as possible, tell them what the goal ultimately should be, and then just turn them loose and let them go. And I, I believe that most of the time, the result will be far better than you ever anticipated. And um, because it was done, one, by people who, who were knowledgeable in the area, but two, people that were passionate about it. So we just need to trust them to do it. Sure. So I feel like I'm being the pessimist of the group today, but I guess <laughs> not, not towards you or your presentation by any means. I think it was fantastic. I guess from my experience, though, oftentimes... Uh, expectations perhaps may not have been met with when someone's been trusted with things and, you know, probably more so outside of masonry than within it. But how, how do you, what's your comments when that happens? There are definitely going to be times where expectations are not met and those are teachable moments, right? You know, we, we are here, we claim that we are here to help people become better. And so if someone, you know, if you've given someone a task and they are not meeting the goal, then, you know, that's, that's the time where it's, it's necessary to step in and, and provide the guidance, provide the counsel, keep them moving in the right direction. Um, you know, the other thing we, you could do is, is help them find a, a partner that was going to work with them. And, but again, you know, it, it, there are definitely going to be times where expectations are not met, right. but you know, that's, that's, that's why we're here. We're, we're trying to help people learn how to meet those expectations. We're trying to help people learn how to be better at, uh, at what they are trying to do. Because I think a lot of times, at least within the lodge, outside of the lodge, maybe life might be a little different, but my experience is with, uh, within the lodge the times that people didn't meet expectations, it was because they didn't understand what the expectations were. Mm -hmm. And that's where this education and, and counsel and guidance comes in is making sure that they are, they're, they're hitting the target that you expected. And uh, you know, maybe, like I said, sometimes when they hit a different target, it may be because they came up with a better plan than you, than you ever thought of, but you know, that hopefully won't be a surprise at the end. You've been kind of watching along the way and realized, oh, they're already so far, so far beyond where I ever hoped they would be. I'm going to wait and see where this lands. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. My, my only caveat would be that that Mason or brother has to have the drive and ambition to do it. Not just, not just yeah. present an idea because presenting ideas is the easy part. Uh, Complaining, yeah. about, complaining about ways to improve is the easy part, but unless that person steps up and actually tries to do something or offer assistance either by themselves or with others, then it really doesn't matter. Uh, so desire is equally yeah. important to that on, their, on their part, right? So you can lead a horse to water, right? But you can't make him drink. Same thing. So Agreed. 
Uh, brother, let's see. Daniel, let me get back to you because you've spoken already. Uh, brother Marty, go ahead. Good evening, and thank you for a really unusual and very valuable approach to Freemasonry. And you've partially addressed my comments, but having taught Masonry and worked in business for many years, if a project goes wrong, I as a master, it's my responsibility. If a project goes right, then it's the brother who was given the uh, project to uh, happen. It's his responsibility. Uh, you have to have a feedback loop. You can't turn anybody loose in a management situation without having monitored him and being aware of where he's going and helping him if you feel he's off track. You just can't walk away. Uh, and that's what I got to say. And good evening once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Martin. You're absolutely right. And, you know, in this concept, this idea of the complex adaptive systems, you know, we could we could spend weeks or months just talking about that topic and explaining those. And one of the ideas that I didn't put into this presentation tonight about those complex adaptive systems is that they are absolutely, as you said, based on feedback loops, both positive and negative. They, you know, there is constant feedback from one individual to another for, with, throughout the group so that they know, you know, if they are succeeding or failing along the way. So you are absolutely right. Feedback is a critical part of the process in any, in any comparison of this. Mm -hmm. Good point, good points. Uh, Brother Jerry. Uh, thank you, Brother Brian and Brother David. Great presentation. Um, I had a question as, as regards to top-down and bottom-up uh, styles within an organization. Um, are they necessarily mutually exclusive? Could be time and circumstances where uh, it might be appropriate for uh, uh, top-down uh, type of style versus bottom-up. Uh, perhaps as a lodge is maybe shifting its um, leadership style from uh, one to the other. Yeah, personally, I mean, I think there's, there's typically a within organizations of people, there are typically a blend. And as I, you know, as I, one of the references I made for, for the top down, you know, typically where those work well is when it's very fast paced, when decisions need to be made immediately, there's no time to wait. And, you know, at, it's kind of like, you know, the old phrase, you know, the buck stops here. At some point in time, there are certain things that happen where somebody has to be responsible, has to step up and say, all right, forget everything else. This is what we're doing. Um, and, you know, so, you know, ideally you avoid those urgent situations as much as possible, but we all know they arise. So absolutely, there's a, there will be a, a blending of the, the, the strategies, if you will, um, and not only from, you know, time to time, but even at the same, same moment there, you know, there may be, you know, some things that are best managed top down and, and other things at the same time that are managed top, bottom up. But the idea, at least from my perspective, is to get as many ideas on the table as possible and, and seriously considered because oftentimes we will end up with options we had never considered before if just one person is making those decisions. Thank you. Brother Daniel. Uh, yes, you know, when I heard you talk about top-down leaders are expecting failure and they tend to embrace an attitude of possessing the totality of the truth that must be imposed on those around them to assure success. It's kind of like the, the nature of man on Locke versus Hobbes. Locke basically says that if you give a person direction, instruction, resources, and step back, that you will have success, because that's the inherent nature of man. Where Hobbes tends to look at the bestiality that basically says, if you are left your own devices, you're gonna be rude and selfish and all sorts of horrors are going to happen. And so when you look at that and say, then top down means you're expecting your employees to be lazy, dishonest, greedy, and self-centered, which is ironically what the top down leadership tends to embrace as strengths. And you impose things on them. 
And as you say, in certain situations that is required, even in a lodge, you know, a master's job is to protect a charter, which means in Ohio, you have to do every degree twice. That's not up for negotiation. You know, it's not something that the lodge can vote to say, oh, we're going to ignore that one and do our own thing, you know. But by and large, if you're looking at the men around you as people with ideas and talents and capabilities that need nurtured, then it's your job to create that space where they have the ability to feel free to express their thoughts, to ask their questions, to share their ideas, and to have that be listened to and attended to. And as long as you're providing that space, as you say, Brother Doherty, things happen. So the question is then, bottom up assumes that people will look for opportunity and growth and success if you, as a manager, allow that to happen instead of forcing a particular strategy on them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, and it is, I, mean, I think it was... Uh, um, brother uh, Brian had said earlier, it, you know, it's almost like the pessimist versus the optimist uh, um, viewpoint. But, you know, in many ways, the top down is the pessimist who assumes things are going to fail. The, top, the bottom up is the optimist who assumes things are going to succeed. And the idea is, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather give people the opportunity to succeed and, and have to help them along the way than assume they're going to fail and be proven right. Um, so, you know, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that I'm the pessimist tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've all got to fill that role one sooner or later. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the, uh, I'll take the bullet for you guys who are staying quiet <laughs> about this. You know, I, I think that a lot of this also is perception and it's how you're, how you grew up too and, and how, and what you do for a living and, and you know how you feel and act politically and and faithfully and really you know so i just don't i guess not in a defensive way i i don't think it's we should paint a picture that a top down leader is a pessimist either i think a top down leader can absolutely lead by example and and start and sweep the bathroom without having to ask someone else to do it by example and whatever else needs to be done so again like nature and like economics, there's an equilibrium somewhere. The goal is how to find it. It's not one's right and one's wrong. I think it's about working together. I think Freemasonry as a whole is a perfect institution like nature. Like nature. What's imperfect is the men that are in it. And we're, we're trying to figure out how to get better, which is why we're here. So um, I guess I would just say that, say that we need to keep looking to nature perhaps for better answers. Um, I don't know. This has been a very unique, interesting topic of conversation. Really, really interesting perspective. Are there any other comments, questions for Worship Brother David? Because if you have them and you haven't asked them, you should ask them because this is a really great topic. You have an expert here with, with us tonight. Well, thank you very much for, for having me out. And I do appreciate the opportunity to, to express my thoughts. Uh, sometimes I, you know, we, we get caught in our own head and we wonder if we're, uh, if we're making any sense. So, so I appreciate the opportunity to, to share and, and see if the thoughts made sense to anybody else. Very nice. Thank you. It was excellent. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, we will move on for the remaining business of the evening. First and foremost, um, if you're not aware, it has come to the attention of Rubicon recently that our very own worship brother, John W. Bizak, uh, was bestowed a very nice award or recognition recently, and that is being inducted into the Society of Blue Friars. For those of you who may not be aware, this society was formed, I believe, in 1932, and it was formed specifically to recognize those Masonic authors that are making a tremendous impact on the trajectory of our fraternity. And Worship Brother Bizak, we want to congratulate you. Uh, 
tell you to, to keep writing papers and books because we're all readers of them. And um, serious congratulations. This is an absolute wonderful honor. Thank you, brother. Uh, and on that note, we are also lucky enough to have you present at our next meeting, which is Monday, March 25th, 7 p.m., and you're going to be talking about the great Masonic can kicking. You want to give us just a brief little teaser about what we're going to be speaking about? Uh, well, this covers a period from uh, 1789 through 2024 and a can that has been kicked down the road uh, in organized masonry in America uh, for all those years. And what can be done about it if we want to silence the can kicking? Great. Look forward to it. Look forward to it. Uh, John, don't go away yet. Would you please let our viewers know a little bit more about the Philolathe Society? Sure. Uh, Brothers, Philolathe Society was founded in 1928. And today it's an international Masonic Research Society and the oldest independent Masonic Research Society in North America. Uh, it was started to serve the needs of those who... We're seeking a deeper insight into the history, ritual, and symbols of masonry, as well as spreading Masonic light. And to learn more about it, uh, follow the link on the screen that you see, and the link will be posted in the chat room box after this announcement. And if you have any questions about it, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. <clears throat> For those of you that are, are, are or, or may not be aware, the transactions of the Rubicon Masonic Society Volume 1 are available for purchase. All proceeds go to the Rubicon Masonic Society, which is a nonprofit organization. We appreciate your support, and we are hopefully putting together a Volume 2 here at some point with more good Masonic education and content uh, within. For those of you who have not seen our documentary, The Masonic Table, please do so. You can go to themasonictable.com to learn more about it. Uh, you can stream it and purchase it or rent it on Amazon Prime. Uh, your support is equally appreciated for that. This has been a slide that continues to stay up until I get this posted. Um, last year, last I believe it was end of August, we did a conference called the Classic Masonic Authors Conference Part 1. And... Some of our very own brothers were giving presentations about Andrew McBride, Joseph Fort Newton, Dwight Smith, Tom Jackson. Uh, and we have a presentation that has been recorded, a little over two and a half hours in length of content, split up into four parts. It's a fantastic presentation. It's been an undertaking to get it completed, but we are very, very close. So uh, when that does come out, we hope you will greatly enjoy it. Um, it will be out soon. Any other final comments from anyone here tonight before we part? Worship Brother Alan Martin, will you please do the honor, sir? Brothers, Grand Architect of the Universe, we thank you for your presence with us this evening. As we prepare to close our meeting, we ask you to continue to bless us in all our undertakings. We ask that you guide our thoughts and actions fortifying every moral virtue within us. We ask that you grant us the necessary strength, wisdom, and courage as we endeavor to work for your great purposes. Amen. So mother be. Thank you, brother. Uh, brothers, thank you all for joining us. Uh, our next meeting is Monday, March 25th, 2024, 7 p.m. Feel free to uh, share this with someone. Invite others to participate. You can RSVP at RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash RSVP. If you're already on our list, you don't need to RSVP, just if you're new. So sign up. We'll see you then. Uh, may we always be happy to meet. Sorry to part and happy to meet again. Brother David, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great evening. We'll talk to you soon. Good night.